Hi, I'm Kirk Jowers and welcome to the March 30th episode of COVID-19 with Dr. Russell Osgathorpe, the Chief Medical Officer of doTERRA and a board certified pediatric infectious diseases specialist. Next, let's look at today's graphic from the World Health Organization. There are now 693,224 confirmed cases, 33,106 deaths, 202 countries with cases. Now, Dr. Osgathorpe, I'd like to look at those same numbers from the time of our first episode until today, just so we have a little bit of perspective on, on, on the trajectory of this uh, pandemic. Sure. So all of these numbers are also from the World Health Organization. Cumulative cases on March 12th, 136,900. March 29th, 638,146. Cumulative deaths, 4,614 on the 12th to March 29th, 30,105. Yeah. And countries with cases, 118 to 202. It's been a really staggering increase over a short period of time. President Trump signed the $2 trillion economic stimulus bill into law. Uh, officials in nearly 200 U.S. cities reported a dire need for emergency equipment. Yeah, Thus, ventilators primarily. That's right. And in this survey, nearly 200 American cities, large and small, reported lacking face masks, mm -hmm. testing kits, ventilators, and other equipment needed to handle the crisis. And in the good news category, which we don't usually get to do in this episode, air pollution has dropped off sharply in many parts of the world. Uh, as businesses shut down and people stay home to avoid spreading the virus. And this reduction also has greatly reduced hospitalizations from acute exposure uh, to bad air. So uh, one of the benefits a, a of tiny social distancing. Silver lining here. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So that all brings us to today's big question, and that is, um, what does R not mean? That seems to okay. be coming up in a lot of coronavirus articles. So the question is a very important question. So R0 is an epidemiologic mathematical term that describes the infectivity of a particular virus. So for instance, if we pick a disease that everybody is familiar with, like influenza, it has an R0, depending on year, of between 1.3 and 1.4. COVID-19, on the other hand, has an R0 that people are guessing right now with a lot of educated guess. I mean, they've looked at what's happened in China and other countries like Italy, and it's right now thought to be between two and three. So if I were to be infected with influenza, I would be expected to spread that virus to 1.3 people. And if you carry that out to 10 generations, you take 1.3, you raise it to the 10th power, you get the number 14, right. which means that I would have been responsible after spreading it to 1.3 people and those 1.3 people to then another 1.3 people, each one of those, then you would get 14 out of 10 generations. Right. For COVID-19, if the R0 is two and you raise that to the 10th power or go to 10 generations, now we're talking about 1,024 people. So you're going from 14 to 1,000 people just by going from 1.3 to two. Exactly. Huh. Even more impressive, however, is if you look at three, that number raised to the 10th power is 59,000. So if the R0 is three, I could be responsible for 59,000 separate infections. And the R0 is not a number of confirmed positives. The R0 number is the number of infections theoretically thought related to the disease. And so we know that there are people that are positive for COVID-19 who never got tested. And that means that we, that, that's why there's wiggle room in the number, why we really don't know what the number, what the R0 number is for COVID-19 yet is, because we don't know what the true denominator is. Right. And it sounds like there's also a little bit of hope. So I understand the uncertainty, but we aren't predestined for this to be a, a 3.0 and 59,000. We could... We can impact that number. It, we can impact that number. Yeah, you're... And, you're right, right. Um, and I, I so have loved our conversations over these last two weeks because you're, you're grasping epidemiology quite nicely. <laughs> but from a population perspective, that R0 number is a population number, not an individual. But if we all acted very responsibly, we could decrease the number of infections, and that's how the curve gets flattened. 
are there some countries that seem to have done a better job than others overall, or at least that we can learn from some things they've done well? Yeah, from the data, um, when you look at the data, and particularly out of China, whose curve is exceptionally flat, um, it looks like from their data that their public health measures have been extremely successful at decreasing the spread of the virus. And uh, from what we've seen of their social distancing policies, as well as compliance to those policies by individual citizens within China, has been really, really high. Right. Other countries have had problems with um, getting individual citizens to comply with social distancing and working from home and um, isolation when you're sick. And so because of that, uh, they have not had the types of flattening that other countries have seen. South Korea saw pretty significant flattening of uh, last week, and we hope that that continues for them. But when we relax policies, we'll see another swell as virus starts to circulate. So these policies and procedures and recommendations that are being made by public health officials of washing your hands and being safe, we've just got to follow them or else that curve will just be continue to accelerate and be exponential in its growth. Well, thank you so much for explaining that to us and thank you for being with us today.